If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell firing up equities with a dovish stance, but can the rally last? We'll discuss that and more on Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin, and here are the top stories. The dovish Fed whacked the dollar, sending the yen stronger for the first time in eight days. Japan's finance minister says he is watching the currency with a high sense of urgency. Chinese tech stock see gains on the back of Tencent with the company announcing plans to double its share buyback and raising dividend payout by 42 percent. And we have a great lineup of guests with BlackRock's head of APEC fundamental fixed income, Neeraj Seth, joining us in just a few minutes. And later on, we'll focus on the Indian economy with Morgan Stanley's chief India economist, Upasana Chuchra. Well, let's get to markets, and I do get a sense I am in the wrong color today. April <laughs> Hong is here in the Lion City, and April, of course, it is an everything rally. It is a Fed party. You're seeing a lot of green on the screen, and this Fed, I think, theme is coming through when you take a look at the EM Asia FX, particularly the Korean one. Look at the way it's jumped below the 13 26 level, the yen also climbing, helped along by Weda's comments in Parliament. He's striking a neutral tone, avoiding dovishness uh, after Japan comes back from that holiday. And we're also seeing that stocks are really rallying hard today. The MSCI Asia Pacific is hovering at a level we haven't seen in two years. Tech is leading the charge. It's helped along not just by the Fed, but also the AI theme. And that's boosting the likes of the Cosby as well as the Nikkei that's gone into the lunch break, upwards of 40,500. And we're also seeing that risk appetite coming in for uh, the Bitcoins as well as Brent. But China, as you can see there, maybe you're in the right color for that, uh, Haas. <laughs> China's a bit of a laggard today. Well, as you said, it's not just about the Fed, it is about tech, it is AI-driven as well. Yeah, and I think the question now is turning into, uh, given how the Fed as well as the AI theme is playing out, how long can the MAG7 keep up the broader rally and the AI theme? For now, it seems like the party, the music keeps going. We have a general optimism around the chips, especially after Micron. Surprised with its revenue forecast, thanks to strong AI demand that it expects that's lifting the broader chip sector in the Asia Pacific. We also have our own Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, you know, our colleagues talking about how for the likes of Samsung and SK Hynix in Korea, they expect sales uh, to recover in the first half of this year. So that seems to be the general optimism around that sector. But I do want to caution here, flip the board, take a look at what we're seeing on the Apple suppliers. DOJ set to sue the iPhone maker as soon as this week for antitrust violations. So those are the ones that are a bit of a Debbie Downer on a day where everything is running higher. That's right. And China will be paying attention. Avril Hong, thank you so much for that. So the Fed not concerned about the recent high inflation readings. Chair Jay Powell says he is not worried as the underlying story of easing price pressures has not changed. The January number, which was very high, the January CPI and PCE numbers were quite high. There's reason to think that, that there could be seasonal effects there. Um, but nonetheless, we don't want to be completely dismissive of it. The February number was high, higher than expectations. I take the two of them together, and I, I think they haven't really changed the overall story, which is that of inflation moving down gradually on a sometimes bumpy road. Equities may be on a tear post fed. However, a survey by our MLive team shows investors are pretty cautious on the outlook for U.S. stocks and treasuries. That's even as Fed officials stick to their guidance on rate cuts this year. Let's dig deeper, get perspective with Garfield Reynolds, who leads our market's live coverage in Asia. Gov, run us through the responses you've seen. Yeah, thanks. So, two key responses. Yes. They expect that stocks will keep rallying. They don't expect that the breathtaking pace we've seen so far this year, you know, up 10% or so, so far, can possibly continue. In fact, 
they see that by the end of the year, the S&P 500 will be uh, just, by five, just above 5,400. That's only about a 4% gain from where we are. So that's a significant slowdown in the pace uh, to come. Meanwhile, bonds you know, can be expected probably to rally at some stage, but there's a strong constituency for the idea that the worst has yet to come when it comes to the bond market. The 10-year yield is seen topping out at something like 4.5%. That's more than 20 basis points above where we are right now. So plenty of scepticism about bonds' capacity to rally, especially in the short term, and scepticism that the current surge in stocks can continue. The one really, really strong reading is that the dollar's best times are behind it. It's seen as sort of at, at best ending the year flat, which seeing as it's already up 2% this year means declines from here on in. And perhaps surprisingly, the yen is seen as outperforming overwhelmingly among major currencies as it comes back from those epic lows that it's been threatening to hit once more uh, in the past week following the BOJ. So investors growing more sceptical of the Fed. you got to wonder, as we get more clarity from regulators, from policymakers, that may change. Uh, yeah, it could change, although in a lot of ways what might matter more for stocks uh, is whether we can go and get in these very strong uh, drivers for gains from AI you know, and, and the Magnificent Seven. You know, they've been the big driver so far this year. And, you know, of course, perhaps you know, certainly part of what's helped with that is that bond yields have come down considerably from the highs reached last year. So that helps on the valuation side. The bigger concern is, OK, even if you have yields coming down or staying stable where they are, for equities to keep climbing from here, you need some of those actually rather poor earnings outlooks that analysts and investors have been expressing. You need that to turn around, which, you know, to bring it right back around to the Fed, if the Fed thinks it's going to be cutting rates three times this year, that signals, you know, it thinks that things are going to slow down in the economy, not crash, but slow down. So in that slowing economic backdrop, can you expect earnings to keep on shooting the lights out? Only if NVIDIA and Micron and the Magnificent Seven keep on, uh, you know, benefiting from AI optimism and indeed that AI optimism continues to lead to concrete results. For now, though, that seems to be pretty much in play. Gafil Reynolds, who leads our markets live coverage in Asia, thank you so much for that. So by the looks of it, more pain not only for stocks but also bonds and the dollar, perhaps. Will those market expectations play out through the rest of this year? Let's ask Niraj Seth, CIO and head of APEC Fundamental Fixed Income at BlackRock. Niraj, first off, the Fed, it did something really important, paved the way for rate cuts this year. Absolutely. I think it was a dovish pause and on right on the back of a dovish, dovish hike from the BOJ. And this is important for the markets. I think Fed has kept the window open to start the rate cuts further down the road. And my base case expectation is we will we'll see that start of rate cuts in summer, maybe June. So I do think uh, looking forward, the Fed has obviously acknowledged the higher inflation prints in Jan and Feb but with an expectation that we are drifting lower in inflation towards the 2% target, and they're not changing the target for sure. So I think it was actually a very important meeting, which in a way is pivotal, now looking towards the easing or the normalization towards the lower rates. So you buy bonds right now, right, to lock in uh, the rates that you have right now. But because of the expectations of a soft landing, that is what is expected? So the key here is, first of all, stepping back, the room for the rate cut is based on where the real rates are. If you look at the rates drifting towards or nominal where they are, and with the inflation coming down, you're getting closer to 300 basis points of real rate. So there is room. If you get rate cuts, you obviously get some benefit of that. Now, there will be a longer debate around the shape of the curve in the U.S. given the fiscal financing. So you can and potentially will see a steepening of the curve so you do want to lock in high yields, not just in the government bonds, but a combination of government bonds, securitized assets, credit, 
and you want to actually have a high yielding portfolio, maybe more concentrated in front end of the curve up to the belly. And as the rate cuts start, it actually will give you the benefit of yield and appreciation. How much support are you seeing in the markets? In terms of the rates, the specifically to the U.S., I think so far it has been extremely well behaved despite the concerns everybody has raised around the fiscal financing. But as we go through the period of the pension funds rebalancing that has been happening over the last 12, 18 months, uh, I think the question will come up again in terms of the marginal buyer. So there will be more concern around belly to the long end, but I do think the front end is pretty well anchored. The thing is, risk premiums are so low right now. Will they remain narrow? Well, and if you mean from a term premium perspective, I do think the term premium needs to go up. In any asset in the world, if you actually have more supply coming than where the demand is today, the marginal buyer defines the price. And I do think as we go into 2025, it's maybe not a this year concern I have, the question around who that marginal buyer for U.S. Treasury, especially the long end is, is going to come back to the table. And don't forget about the U.S. elections, which we are getting close to. So by, by the time we get to the third or fourth quarter of the year, the markets will go away from just the Fed focus to where the elections are going and the potential for the fiscal financing post the elections in next year. So I do think in the longer end that does come as a question, but front end, given it's much more driven by the Fed fund rates, it's well anchored. We have our MLive colleagues asking which assets will outperform by the end of the year. Would that be fixed income? I actually think on a risk-adjusted basis, the front end of the fixed income will do extremely well, and you want to have a diversified portfolio. Again, taking a step back, if you look around the world, we have not seen this level of divergence in economic and monetary policy cycle. We have four camps of central banks. You have the central bank like US, the Fed, where there's room to cut. You have the European Central Bank where there's a need to cut and more developed economies are joining that. Then you have the central banks waiting to cut, which is most of Asia. And then you have central banks which are normalizing towards hiking, that's Japan. There has not been this level of divergence. So if you pick your points right in terms of where you take duration and where you take carry, I think it's a great asset class today. How do you best play? How do you best trade that divergence? I think you want to take more longer duration in the economies like Europe. Maybe I would argue, in fact, over time, uh, Australia will join the, that uh, England, where you want to take more duration, where you do expect the rates to come down. And fiscal financing question is there, but not as much as the US. And US, you want to have higher quality asset in front end of the curve and across credit and securitize to build a portfolio that yields you six and a half, seven percent lock in that today, and you just go enjoy life. Not everybody has joined the party. If you take a look at money sitting on the sidelines, we're talking about trillions of dollars, three, four, five. Well, it varies. When do you see that money being mobilized? What would it take? The actual rate cut. Because the money that is sitting in the money market fund, and that number has gone up by at least a couple of trillion in the last few years, crossing it north of a trillion now globally, the actual yield is based on the short end of the curve, the T-bills basically, plus the other money market instruments. Now, that yield does not change till the Fed starts cutting. So once the Fed starts cutting, you start thinking about the reinvestment risk. We have seen uh, some mobilization of that money into the fixed income and other assets, in fact, in the equities in the last six months. But I do think that actually accelerates once the Fed starts to cut. Okay, BOE, next one. Expected to stand pad. What are you anticipating? What kind of messaging and how do you trade that? I think that's probably going to be a bit more balanced at this point. Obviously, you've seen some improvement in inflation, but not anywhere close to where it needs to be. So I think there you want to be neutral on duration here and on sell-off, go longer. All right. Niraj, hang tight. Niraj, Seth, BlackRock is sticking around. Still to come, we'll look at how the latest Fed decision could influence the rate path of India's central bank. Morgan Stanley's chief India economist will be sharing her insights.
Welcome back. China's economy is struggling, but its neighbor India is squarely on the radar of investors as well as manufacturers. The first two decades of the 21st century were largely the story of China's rise. Will the next two be the story of India's? Niraj Seth, CIO and head of APEC Fundamental Fixed Income at BlackRock, is still with us. It does seem like investors still buying the India story. I think it's a, it's the most transformational story in the world today by a long margin. And again, if we go back a little bit, like 500 years, you would see India and China were more than 50% of the global economy. I think they're slowly coming back. Now we've seen some pause in the, the growth story of China, but what's happening in India is actually quite remarkable. And it's built on the stability the demographics and the infrastructure, and then it's getting the tailwind of geopolitics. And when you think of stability, you have politics, policy, macroeconomics. It's transformational, and I do think if you continue to see that political and policy stability, this story has 20 more years, at least if not longer. But we're talking about stretch valuations, and some people say, you know what, relook, reassess, perhaps it is time to buy China, take money out of India, Put it into China because it's been battered, and you know what? We probably would have seen the bottom already. So that's an interesting point because that point would have been discussed last year, year before, or <laughs> so. Question is, at what point you're going to be right, and even a broken clock is right twice a day. So obviously there will be point where this will happen. But if I again think about the investor flows, so portfolio investor flows versus the FDI. The way I would think of is the liquid market, so the public market flows will have that tactical view around India, China, and in fact Japan and where you allocate. And we've seen some reallocation of that China to India and Japan in the last 18, 24 months. Some of that will go back. Private markets, probably more towards India. And then the FDI, for sure, away from China, more towards India, Vietnam, Mexico, Malaysia, Thailand, and a number of other Asian economies. So what's the bet in India? What's the bet in China? So the key in India is I, you want to go with the long duration assets for actually writing the macro story. The public markets are stretched, so it's very hard to build a very bull case for the Indian public equities, uh, although you still have the benefit of compounding if the growth rate is where it is. In case of China, I do think people are underestimated the size or the growth of that economy and hence the opportunities that exist in the public market. So I would tactically be long China here, but as I said, it's a little harder to take a much longer term view because of the policy certainty that you need. When it comes to certainty, we'll see certainty in the Indian election. Modi is set to come back to power. Uh, which sectors would be the ones to play? I think you will see a continuation of the infrastructure build. Within that, the green energy, renewable power. I think that's a long way to go before India gets to the point of the scale it needs. You will have the consumer story, and I like more and more of the discretionary story as the, the income levels are rising and you have more discretionary income spend that's going through. Financial sector, I think, is going through a huge transformation. If you look at the financial inclusion, and the digital infrastructure that has been built in India. Just a simple example, the number of SIP accounts investing in the equity markets has gone up from nowhere 10 years ago to 79 plus million as of last month, and it's growing at a couple of million every month. There is a big story of financial inclusion happening, and the next step will be the deepening of capital markets. Uh, Niraj, of course, one very exciting market right now is Japan. We've seen how some companies, banks in particular, have been ramping up uh, their presence in, in the Japanese market. How are you looking at it? Where are the opportunities? So I'm extremely positive on Japan. And again, if we have to take a longer horizon, if we had put your money in Nikkei in 1989, December, you were up 4% as of today. If you had put the same money in S&P at that point, you were up 1,740%. So there's a little bit of a catch-up game here, but the key here in case of Japan is it's a combination of nominal growth, which is actually going to push the earnings momentum higher. You have structural reforms, which are finally happening. And then you have the tailwind of geopolitics and the artificial intelligence, the technology supply chain. So all in all, I would argue that Japan still has a long runway if they keep their peril on structural reforms and nominal growth stay, stay strong. But when it comes to the BOJ, are people expecting too much from the central bank? The BOJ has made it really clear, you know what, there, there won't be uh, consecutive rate rises. So I think there's always a 
whether you call it muscle memory or trying to take experiences from other markets and overlay on, on Japan, I don't think that works. The, the story of Japan is much longer, history of deflation coming out. I think BOJ will be patient. In my base case, I would expect one rate hike this year, potentially later part of the year. If inflation really accelerates, maybe two. So I don't think you're going to get an aggressive BOJ normalizing the monetary policy. And it's not to support the equity market. It's to support the durability of inflation and nominal growth in the country. To be fair, the BOJ has been very patient. I want to touch on Indonesia. I mean, we're seeing funds currently pulling money out of Indonesia. There are concerns. You say it's politics. I think a lot to do with politics, obviously, the, the decisions around the cabinet and the policy from here. Because one thing never to forget, in emerging markets, and in true for any emerging markets, you cannot ignore politics. And I, as we get more clarity in terms of the cabinet, the finance ministry, potential for obviously the central bank path, I do expect the interest to come back in the local currency government bonds. In terms of real rates, it's one of the most attractive in the region. The BI has the most room to cut, but there's a bit of history there because of the currency stability requirements or the focus. I think BI will not cut ahead of the Fed. So combination of BI and the political stability that comes in the next couple of quarters, I do expect that interest to come back in Indonesian local bonds. All right, clarity will come possibly in October. When we'll, Prabowo, we'll have that. When Prabowo possibly becomes the president, when it is confirmed. Niraj Shah, BlackRock, we thank you so much for your insights today. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back, and here are some top U.S. political stories we're following. Bloomberg has learned the Biden administration is weighing blacklisting a number of Chinese chip firms linked to Huawei. Sources say most of the Chinese firms that could be affected have been identified as chip-making facilities acquired or built by Huawei. Huawei has made te technological advances despite existing sanctions, including a smartphone chip many in Washington thought was beyond its capabilities. President Biden says a $20 billion award to Intel shows his support of U.S. industries that had withered under Donald Trump's tenure. Speaking in Phoenix, Biden says the award will support 10,000 manufacturing jobs. Biden is touting government spending as part of his swing state blitz as he heads into an election rematch with Trump in November. The bottom line, I want to build a future in America. My predecessor is going to let the future be built in China and other countries, not America. Well, China heading to lunch uh, very shortly. No rally there, unlike the rest of the region rallying post uh, Fed. We have the CSI 300 index currently down by two tenths of one percent. The yuan trading at 719.85 again, pretty flat versus the USD. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. I think this is a signal, and the market is taking it as that, that they will tolerate slightly higher inflation for longer. The threshold to cut rates is a little higher than many people thought, but also they're not talking about raising rates, even though they've had this higher inflation. I think this is a Fed that really wants that soft landing to continue. They also are not willing to you know, raise rates again, and I think that's important too. So we still think we're gonna cut rates this year. Timing's uncertain, and he, you know, he said over and over again, it depends on the data. It's really much closer to uh, a two-cut scenario, but they didn't go with that at all, and neither did the, neither did the market narrative. The Fed's still committed to trying to get inflation down to 2%. But I think what's, what's driving Powell is the fact that he thinks that monetary policy is restricted. Some of our guests on the Fed maintaining its outlook for three interest rate cuts this year. Let's do a check-in on how those Fed signals are playing out in Japan. Avril Hong is here with me. Avril. Yeah, how's we're seeing the Nikkei and Japanese markets coming 
back from the lunch break, but also from that holiday yesterday. So let's take stock of what we've seen for Japan assets this week, right? We had a BOJ that struck a dovish tone and a Fed that's signaling that those rate cuts this year are still likely relatively weak yen, hovering above the 150 level against the greenback. So all that is fueling what we see on the Nikkei today. That's really being boosted as well by the tech stocks, thanks to partly because of the Fed, but also that AI theme that is playing out. The Nikkei coming back from the lunch break, 1.6% higher. Let's flip the board and take a look at what we're seeing cross assets. We did get some comments from the BOJ governor as he spoke in parliament. He struck a more neutral tone, less dovish than perhaps some in the markets might be expecting. So we're seeing the yen moving towards that 150 level, but still relatively weak. And as I say, it's been pretty good for equities today, Haas. Well, that's right. It's all green pretty much across the board. April Hong, thank you. Now, as the Fed keeps their outlook for three cuts in 2024, the ECB tempering hopes for additional monetary easing after a possible first cut in June. President Christine Lagarde reiterates the central bank's decisions will have to remain data dependent. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle and that if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. This implies that even after the first rate cut, we cannot, we cannot pre-commit to a particular rate path. However tempting that is, however much some of you would like to see it, if we are honest to our methodology, and if we have discipline in adhering to these principles, we cannot. For more on markets, let's bring in M Live strategist Mark Cranfield. There we have it. They're not synchronized anymore. Uh, traders don't have the same discipline as Christine Lagarde. <laughs> they, all they, all they want to hear is the good news. They just want to hear that the everything rally is back and you can buy bonds, you can buy stocks, you can sell the dollar, you can just do all the things that you were doing at the beginning of the year when people thought the Fed was going to be cutting rates indefinitely. We had a bit of a hiccup in between, but we're back on track now. The, I mean, the surprise clearly was that going into this meeting, there'd been a lot of pushback from Fed people on the hawkish side of the spectrum. They've been, the way they've been speaking, the market was getting ready for the fact that the dot plots for this year would be reduced to only two interest rate cuts. That didn't happen. So that was a pleasant surprise for, for people across asset markets. And then even during the, the press conference, Jerome Powell managed to get a pretty neutral tone there, slightly dovish, but more to the neutral side. And again, that was a pleasant surprise because he didn't use the press conference to try and pour any damp water on that story as well. So people came away from it thinking, great, here goes the Fed. They're going to essentially ignore inflation numbers to a degree. It's on the right path. Give or take a little bit. That's fine. Rates are coming down. Equity market likes it. And of course, the bond market does as well. So this everything rally, is it sustainable? We talk about how, you know, the rally uh, in the S&P is pretty much driven by tech anyway. So all it takes is for tech to be under pressure for it to go, well, topsy-turvy. In, in a way, the, the equity sector yeah, is a little bit special because the AI related story has driven things in such a way that they've been almost ignoring some of the things going on in other parts of the world. So yes, um, if you see a sudden reversal, and particularly in some of the, these big names, the so-called Magnificent Seven in America, that could derail everything. There's definitely a risk there. Um, doesn't appear to be, I mean, if you hear some of the comments we've had from NVIDIA particularly recently, um, that in the short term they see sales and, and orders being so good that that um, is very strong for them. You've got a company like Tencent in Hong Kong as well, is also doing big buybacks. So the general picture is, is pretty healthy. The interest rate situation is not really going to change that too much. Something out of the left field, of course, is always a risk there. But you get a general mood here where people probably were a little bit underweight because they were concerned that the Fed was going to push back harder. There's going to probably going to be some money pouring into the market here, particularly they can probably see daylight between here and mid-year. So one quarter ahead, they can probably see blue skies. That's good enough for now. And for the uh, bond market, we had Niraj Seth saying, lock it in. 
Yes, um, but then again, you've also got a big yield curve play going on as well here because of the, the fact that the, the Fed, they kept um, three cuts for this year, but they also retained three for next year as well. And what we've already seen is a little bit of the, the, the Treasury curve has been inverted for a long time. We saw a little bit of that inversion come out yesterday, more interest in the short end than the long end of the curve. There's a long way to go in that trade. If you, if you think that the, the Fed is going to achieve all those cuts that it's projecting, then the two-year yield can come down quite a bit more relative to the longer end of the curve. So that in itself is going to keep a lot of money flooding back into bonds. Mark, surely there is a risk. Uh, is it terribly underpriced? I mean, on the back of that, you see the gold prices getting to record highs right now. Well, it's a, it's a relative game for, for people in those kind of sectors. So they look at what's happening in cryptocurrencies are still very hot. A lot of money flying in there. So gold doesn't look particularly expensive compared to that. If you also tell people that interest rates are capped, if anything, they're heading lower. Again, that's a supportive backdrop for gold. And of course, it loves it when the US dollar is generally weaker. That's also positive for metals in, in general, not just for, for gold and silver. So those things are falling into place. Central banks have been buying gold as well. And surprisingly, flows have been going out of ETFs. Now, in the past couple of years, that has been a big drag on the gold market. They seem to be ignoring it. And if those people are forced, if there's a FOMO feeling, they have to come back in and buy those ETFs. That's even more positive for gold as well. All right, Mark, thank you. And my strategist, Mark Cranfield. Let's do a check on uh, Tencent as well as Geely. After their earnings, we know that Tencent was a marginal beat, but a beat nonetheless. Uh, that shift towards high margin ads, fintech set to drive earnings through 2024. Domestic game sales, though, miss, but that was pretty much expected. Tencent up about 1.4%. Geely Auto currently up by 1.5% right now. Also a beat. It did reiterate further sales growth this year despite China's car market uh, slowing due to weaker consumer spending. Well, as we said, Tencent planning to more than double its stock buyback program to at least $12.8 billion this year. That's after it posted a lot and expected revenue due to soft domestic game sales. Let's get more with Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Robert Lee. Rob, what's your take on those uh, Q4 numbers? OK, well, uh, I think you said it all in your intro, has Linda, so I'm not sure what else I can add. But uh, games, domestic games in particular, has been a source of weakness through the last year. So whilst, you know, in all honesty, the, the, the revenue numbers on game side did come through, a bit weaker than expector, expected, we saw a shift towards higher margin businesses, particularly driven by short videos, um, driving 150 uh, basis point beat at the gross margin level. So whilst, as you said, the overall numbers were, you know, 1% ahead or so, I think, you know, th th it became apparent that the, the, the drivers we saw coming through in Q4 is what's likely to continue to drive the company and the fundamental earnings uh, through 2024, and therefore we take comfort from that, I think. So it's, it's business as usual, you know, steady as she goes sort of message. I do apologise for stealing your thunder there, Rob. How do the Q4 <laughs> results impact the company's outlook for 2024? Yeah, as I said, I, I think it was a, gave confirmation as to the themes that we've been um, identifying as that are likely to continue driving the company through this year. So again, short videos uh, with uh, a shift towards mini games as well, which is a particularly high margin business. So superior growth in those higher margin areas of business, driving over, uh, underlying earnings and helping support and in fact, uh, likely driving uh, further likely increases on the gross margin side. Whereas again, there's been a lot of comment about the game sector. I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, not in a, I'm not in denial that there are weaknesses on the game side. Some of those are self-inflicted because the company arguably took their eye off the ball. But put things in context, domestic games is only 17% of 10 cents revenue. And as I said, even with the revenue miss on the domestic game side, the gross margin for this business beat consensus expectations by 150 basis points in the quarter. So, you know, the ongoing drivers, short videos, etc., is what gonna, is going to drive the earnings and the company for the rest of this year, with the upside on the buybacks and the dividend adding a little bit of icing on the cake, perhaps. When we last spoke, we talked about how you added Tencent to BI's focus list. Have the results confirmed your view on that? Yes, 
one never wants to be complacent, and again, you have to keep an open uh, uh, mind and an open view to things. But no, I, I think, again, the fundamental drivers are in place. The Q4 numbers um, confirm that. As I said, games as a percentage of their revenue is decreasing. Uh, they're putting um, in place some measures to try and drive better monetization from their domestic games business. But again, domestic games is only 70% of revenue. If you think back to 2017 or so, games in total was about 40% of their, their revenue. So it's, it's considerably smaller than it was as a percentage of, of overall revenue. And there are new drivers emerging within their business, which are not just have a better secular growth outlook, but are also potentially higher margin in the long run. And I think that's where investors should be focused, and the fact that the stock's up a couple of percent today sort of confirms that I think overall the market's taken these results quite positively. Rob, thank you so much for that. Lumbic Intelligence Senior Alice. Rob Lee, he was right in uh, his take, so you may want to listen to him. Well, we talked about how Tencent and Geely were out with earnings. There are other companies out with earnings uh, later today as well, the likes of uh, Ping An Insurance, uh, Sinook, China City Bank, as well as uh, CK Assets as well. So it's going to be a busy day ahead for earnings. Meantime, the Hang Seng Index up. Uh, about 1.8%. It was uh, surging past that 2% mark earlier on. Still to come, a deep dive into the Indian economy with Morgan Stanley. We'll be getting their thoughts on the RBI's next move after the Fed held rates for a fifth straight meeting. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. You're watching India Focus. Two minutes to the start of uh, the Indian session and futures are pointing to a higher open. Not surprising given the huge rally we're seeing in Asia. The MSCI Asia Pack Index up about 2%. The Sensex currently pointing up by about six tenths of 1%. In terms of the currency versus the U.S., the 83.05 is uh, the level we're looking at right now. The rupee up about a tenth of 1%. It is about the Fed largely sticking to its path of interest rate cuts despite the recent pickup in inflation. Meanwhile, the Reserve Bank of India appears to be concerned that inflation will be slow to fall to its 4% medium-term target. So are the chances of a rate cut by the RBI, pretty much distant now. Let's bring in Upasana Chachura, Chief in the Economist at Morgan Stanley. Upasana, good to have you with us. So what are we looking at? That rate cut may come in what, 2025 perhaps? Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, I think uh, India's inflation and growth numbers uh, are sort of moving in line with ex expectations. Uh, we are seeing growth trend, which has actually surprised on the upside. So growth momentum remains strong, a tad stronger than expected. And on the inflation side, inflation has been moderating. Uh, so we have seen numbers go down from uh, the above 6% level that we saw made of last year to around 5% now. And also the silver lining being that core inflation has been moderating as well. And it's tracking at multi-month lows of sub 4% currently. Um, so in that sense, uh, we do uh, think that inflation will average probably at 4.5% in fiscal 25 on the next fiscal. That's in line with the RBI's uh, published numbers as well for uh, CPI inflation that they expect in fiscal 25. So um, on the face of it, a moderating inflation trend uh, will open up the opportunity for a shallow easing cycle in our view, probably uh, sometime in the, uh, in the latter part of fiscal 25. But uh, we have been highlighting risks of a delayed start, primarily driven by, you know, this very upbeat trend in growth that we are seeing. So growth data, as we have, we've seen in the last couple of quarters, has surprised us and consensus to the upside. And we have been revising numbers higher for fiscal 24. Uh, fiscal 24. So in that context, I think we'll have to, uh, we'll probably be looking at uh, the risk that of a delayed start um, in our view. Under what circumstances do you think the RBI might just bring forward its rate cuts? I mean, how closely is it watching the Fed? Um, global developments will uh, matter and will have some impact on their reaction function. 
uh, but having said that of course uh, you know domestic inflation domestic growth and where we are on primarily on the inflation cycle will have a larger bearing on the uh, on the rbi's reaction function so um the 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 question that you pose on what premise can they bring forward the rate cut and that will pro- primarily be driven by uh, the inflation trajectory so we obviously know rbi has to keep inflation between 2 to 6% and the medium term objective is 4% um uh, by rbi's own uh, uh, forecast for fiscal 25 inflation is averaging at 4 and a half percent we will probably see a number close to 4 or even sub 4% in our view in the september quarter but that is being driven by transient base effects and then you know the number goes above 4% as well uh, so i think the the, the prim- mice would be a faster than anticipated uh, drop in inflation and that which looks more sustainable and not driven by just transient base effects or you know certain commodity mm-hmm. price impacts which may flow through you talked about core inflation which is falling in fact it is at the lowest level should the rbi be paying more attention to core uh, versus food inflation which is pretty much demand driven um see from an analytical perspective definitely core inflation has um, uh, you know has uh, there is merit to track core inflation and that's why uh, the rbi also obviously would be looking at core inflation and has been citing that in their uh, monetary policy documents and their comments as well that the moderation in core inflation bodes well and it sort of shows that um the, the tightening that the rbi did post uh, 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 post the pandemic and the normalization in policy is you know having some impact on the uh in on the inflation trend which is influenced by monetary policy uh but uh, look the mandate for the rbi is headline inflation and that is uh, driven by the fact that food still accounts for a very high share in terms of the consumption baskets of households and therefore food inflation can influence household inflation expectations and i think uh, that is where it stems from the focus and the mandate to uh, for uh, to keep headline inflation lower uh, and not just look at core inflation because households inflation expectations can get influenced uh, a lot more by the trends in food inflation uh, and if food inflation shocks tend to be uh, systematic and um, re- uh, recurrent uh, then their impact on headline inflation also starts uh, to be more uh, uh, you know not just temporary and therefore i think the focus continues and probably rightly so remains on headline inflation in context of how the consumer spending patterns are in india upasana what does it all mean for growth we know the rbi says 8 or close to 8% is possible but we also know that part of the growth has been driven by money that's been pumped into the equity markets and now with investors reassessing their money in that market perhaps pulling it back putting it back to china how might that put that growth target at risk see um when you look at the drivers of growth actually in this cycle what you're seeing is that growth is being driven by a uh, uh, by a pickup in capex so capex investments have been uh, have have been the sort of front runner of uh, amongst all the drivers of growth and uh, this is what we saw in the 2003 to 7 cycle as well and if you look at the uh, gdp uh, growth by the supply side agri industry services again it's the industrial segments manufacturing or construction uh, you, know, you know utilities etc which have been driving growth higher so in that context it's actually a pretty um, a solid start to the growth cycle uh, because that's how productive growth cycles start you see pick up in capex and that momentum uh, when sustained helps to create more jobs and in india with a you know the, the demographic dividend that we all talk about you need to create more jobs and more well paying jobs so that uh, the consumption growth can also sustain at at a decent level so i i'm not really too worried about flows uh, right. into equity markets kids being volatile and we think this is a you know a sustained expansion cycle that we are looking at for india this time how about the impact of india being included in the jp morgan bond index what does it mean for the rupee for interest rates <clears throat> so the bond index inclusion is obviously good news from a flows perspective um given india's current account deficit has also been moderating or narrowing in the last um, 12 months um the you know the, it it is a positive for the balance of payments overall <clears throat> 
And so the uh, the bond index flows are expected to be staggered, and uh, our team expects these to be in around 25 to 30 billion dollars over the next uh, you know as the bond index inclusion starts from uh, June this year to end of this fiscal year when it should conclude, and. Okay. Um, uh, that will be positive from uh, interest rate and um, you know, the rupee perspective as well, just because it Im improves the demand supply right. dynamics of the government security market and also obviously further improves the balance of payment situation, which already do remains pretty robust. Do you think the increased flows can be absorbed by the RBI? Um, so it will be staggered. See, the flows would uh, increase. The weight of the uh, India bonds would increase by about one percent every month, and the flows will therefore be probably two and a half to three billion dollars every month. Uh, in that context, it should not be a big challenge for the RBI to absorb this, especially you know given the size of the government borrowing as well and the size of the BOP. It it may have some transient issues with liquidity management, but then they have many tool uh, tools in their liquidity management framework and that toolkit which will help them to, you know, manage those transient issues like, you know, uh, reliance on variable right. rate, uh, repo, reverse repo operations and other such measures. Mm. So I don't really foresee it should be a big challenge given it's going to be staggered. Upasana, great insights. Upasana Chachra from Morgan Stanley. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Well, it is a party in Asia tracking gains in the U.S. overnight after the Fed kept rates on change as expected, highlighting that the dot plot is pretty much intact at three cuts this year, despite that rise in PC estimate. But Powell did say again he wants to see more evidence inflation is coming down. The Hang Seng Index up 1.7 percent, lifted uh, pretty much by tech stocks. Nikkei 225 back from that holiday yesterday, currently up by 1.5 uh, percent as well. Gains pretty much across the board. The Kospi lifted by tech up 2 percent as we speak. And speaking of tech, we're tracking chip stocks in particular, and that's on the back of Micron Technology, giving a third quarter forecast that is much stronger than expected. It also reported second quarter results that surge past expectations. We know Micron surge uh, up to 15 percent in extended trading. We're seeing Tokyo Electron trading up at this point in time. SK Hynix, Samsung also in the positive. Hynix up by more than 8 percent. Smith, though, in the opposite direction, under a slight pressure, down about a tenth of 1 percent. Let's do a check on uh, U.S. as well as European uh, uh, assets at this point in time. We're expecting the BOE decision. It is expected to keep rates unchanged at 5.25 percent. Futures pointing to a higher open. Of course, uh, we know that rates are at a 16-year high. BOE set to uh, come up with its decision after the Fed. That is it. From Bloomberg Markets Asia, Daybreak Middle East and Africa is next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.